You ever have one of those days you feel like you're walking through a fog? One, one of those weeks? One of those years? Right? I want you to look close. Can you read the title of the screen of my message? Can you read it? Something to the fog. Right? Right? It's, it's hard though, right? Are we, are we sure? What if, what if we bring it out a little bit? If I bring it out a little bit, maybe this will help. You see? Oh, there it is. it's magic, right? Focusing through the fog. Did you catch the lyrics of that last, that last verse? When everything's falling apart, when I'm walking through chaos, I won't be afraid. I've been talking with some people, some dear friends this, this past Tuesday, talking to a dear friend up here. And... Uh, we got to talking, how do you survive when there's so much going wrong? How do you get through life when it feels like you're in a fog bank? You know, and I just, I'm reminded, you don't have to know everything. You just have to know you serve a God who is there. And you literally take the next step. That's it. That's all you're required to do. I don't know about you, man, my March was that. In fact, some of my April was that. It felt like it was a fog, like a heavy fog bank. Like, everything was so hard. You know what I mean? Like, you feel like you're in slow motion, like walking through molasses, where even the easy things feel difficult. You ever have one of those? Anybody? Good, thank you. All right, four, four honest people, just me. All right, I'm going to talk to you four. Here's what we're going to do. No. Today, I hope this is very helpful, because I wasn't sure where the Lord was leading me with this message, and... He gave me a brand new word because of the road many of you are walking right now. Some of you are in that fog bank, man. It is thick. And you've got some dark, negative loops going. I get it. It's so easy, so easy to put your focus right here. So easy to get stressed out and think, well, what about this? What about that? How do I reach this? You know, no, 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 no. Your job, faithful soldier, is to just take the next step. Just be obedient today. God will take care of the details. I needed a change of scenery a few weeks ago and uh, didn't really have time to, to get away more than a day. So I told the family, pack your clothes. We're going on an adventure. We're going to go camping at Jordan Lake. So we took the pop-up camper out to Jordan Lake. Unfortunately for me, my timing could not be worse. It ended up being the hottest day ever, like in Regno, but the hottest day in March. And it was buggy and polleny and humid. And y'all, you know me. I got three fans on me right here, and I'm still slick, right? <laughs> this was a deadly combo for me. And I, I went, my attitude was already like, mm, just, nobody talk to me. I just need to be alone. I'm in a fog. I just, you know, everything's hard. It took eight tries to just back that silly thing up into that spot. You know, if you ever backed it up, it's backwards. It's like, oh, it's no, no, wait. Oh, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so I... I couldn't wait to get that thing popped up because I knew I had salvation in this black box on the roof. Anybody know what that is? It is salvation. It is God-blessed air conditioning. They're having that in heaven. I know that. It's got to be. And I knew if I could just get that pop-up camper up and turn that AC on, all would be right with the world. And I had my buddy with me. He was helping me out. Besides, we had a new awning off to the, the left side. You can't see that, you know, we'll put that up and give you some nice shade. I've never put it up before, but how hard could it be? <laughs> oh, you've been there. So when you're popping up a camper, you better get everything done on that top part before you raise it all the way up. Or you, unless you brought ladders, you're not going to get the awning out. You're not going to get stuff hooked up. Just forget it. You better do it while it's still kind of close to the ground, right? So we're sweating, and we crank that bad boy up, and we, we pop it out. I'm trying to get it done before the ladies come out, because they're going to come right before the park closes. They shut the gates at 9, which is really weird. Kind of makes me feel claustrophobic. Don't really like it, but that's just the way it is. So they, they're getting ready. They're driving, and I'm like, I am drenched. I am like, you could just sling the sweat out. I was like, Milo, come inside. It's the grand coronation. I reach my hand on that air conditioning, and I turn it on. Click. The silence was deadly. And I just, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. Listen, maybe I clicked it the wrong way. Click, click. Still silence. Click, 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 click. <laughs> click, 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 click. 
Dear Lord, baby Jesus, sweet six pound, nine ounce, baby Jesus in the manger. If you, if you can work a miracle right now, I am counting on this. Click. Okay. Milo, come on, we gotta check the fuses. You got young eyes. See what these things look like. So we pop the fuse. I'm pulling out fuses. I'm looking left around. Does this look blown? Does this look blown? Just, I can't. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what a blown fuse looks like. Putting them in. I'm checking stuff. I'm like calling Amy. I'm like, where are you? She's like, I'm near Beaver Creek. I'm like, turn around, go to Lowe's, buy every fuse. Just do it. Well, which one? Just buy them all. It doesn't matter. We got to get air conditioning. I am miserable. I am drenched. My clothes are sticking to me and I'm going to, I'm going to lose my mind if I have to sleep like this. I cannot do it. She's like, oh, I'll turn. oh, what? Lowe's is closed. And it closed at nine. I'm like, oh, all right. Well, come on out. We'll just suffer through this. Maybe, maybe we'll figure something out. So I'm like all night long looking at tutorials on YouTube. Like what went wrong with my AC? Like, fix it. I'm like, okay, let's try that. All right, everybody up. We got to fix it. Oh, that's not it. We're I'm trying everything. I'm so mad. I got a little fan. That's all I got. A little fan on, you know. I know the power's working because we got lights on inside. It's a little tiny fan. Like, it's doing nothing. It was that kind of night where you roll over in the sleeping bag and it sticks to you. You know what I'm talking? Yes, right? It's miserable. Couldn't wait for the sun to get up. I was done. Let's just go home. This is ruined. But I still had that shiver of hope. And I said, let's go to AutoZone. Let's just buy every fuse there. We'll go wherever, right? Wait for the gate to unlock. I'm, I'm, he's like, did you bring the fuses? I'm like, I had to bring the fuses? He's like, well, I got to know which ones. You've got a thousand to choose from. I'm like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. Everything is hard. Everything's getting on my nerves. I'm just going to go back. And we're going to take the pop-up camper down, and we're done. We'll just chalk it off of the failure. If anyone asks where we were, we didn't do this. We just, we, <laughs> I wouldn't lie, but I wouldn't volunteer the information until <laughs> today. So as we're pulling it down, Amy hears me exclaim loudly, you have got to be kidding me. On this next picture, I will reveal what I saw. This little yellow plug right here, that's yellow, so you can't miss it, is supposed to plug into that black dot up there before you raise it. That's the air conditioning power. I give you example A, cord still down, no power. I didn't even plug it in. Yes, laugh at my pain, thank you. It was so humiliating. I almost didn't tell my wife. I was like, she's going to leave me. If I, if I tell her, I didn't, I sweat through that whole night and was not fun to be around because of my fault. See, I was so focused on that awning that I was nervous about. And I was so fuzzy on the details. I couldn't see through the fog. I missed the most easy thing. And it ruined my night. And I got to thinking about this. Today, we are going to learn how to focus through the fog. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 4. You might say that is where we are camping out today. See what I did there, right? Go ahead and find Philippians 4, because we're going to look at a word that Paul has, and it's focus. Focus is a word that a lot of people hear, and a lot of people think they understand, but it's, believe it or not, it's biblical. It's something God desires for us. Here's a truth I want us to recognize. The world around us loves to be a thief when it comes to our focus. The world around us would love nothing more than to get you distracted by all that's going wrong, all the sweat, all the bugs, all the pollen, all the issues going on at work, all the stuff going on at home, all your health concerns. They would love us to do nothing more than to focus on that and give up our joy and give up our reason for being here, to be light, to be salt. Most of us choose to focus. It's triggered by what we think about. That little thing, boom, and we're right here. This is what we think about, right? And our thoughts have the power to either drag us down to that emotional pit of despair or to lift us up where we belong, up on the mountain. And we have these extremes that we go back and forth. It is so easy to be distracted and let someone else's negativity take you down. It is so easy to whip out your phone and start scrolling, doom scrolling, and looking at what everybody else is doing, everybody else has, everything else going perfect, everybody has their best foot forward on Instagram, chap snap a tick attack, whatever the latest thing is, and you look you're like, man, I, I want that. And pretty soon we have this negative loop playing, and we think, where's God? Why is everything so hard? Why do I feel like I'm walking in slow motion 
through the fog. You can be so focused on what's going wrong that you miss what God is doing, not only in your present, but what he's got for you in the future. Simply put, our first truth is this. Our focus has the potential to influence our faith. Did you know that? Our focus has the, the, the whole potential to influence our faith. So as we forge through the fog, I want us to allow God to influence our focus, to put it on the positive things that he is talking about. And let's just be honest. It is going, for some of us, it is going to take some rewiring today. Are you open to that? You open to that? Because God has something so powerful. Look with me, Philippians 4, starting in verse 4. He says this, sometimes be full of the joy in the Lord. Oh, all, okay, I've got the wrong. Always be full of the joy in the Lord. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. You know what? Read that again. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Then, did you catch this? When you do that, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your mind as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, what's honorable, what is right, what is pure, and lovely and admirable, okay? Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then, there's the word again, then the God of peace will be with you. Always read a second translation because God has some great things to glean out of. Look at it for the MSG. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean revel in him. Isn't that great? Make it clear, make it as clear as you can to everyone you meet that you're on their side, working with them and not against them. Help them see that the master is about to arrive. He can show up at any minute. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Is that not awesome? That is gold. Let your worries be shaped into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. Thank you, Jesus. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Summing it up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true and noble and reputable and authentic and compelling and gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise, not things to curse. Think about this. I'll just pause right there. Think about what we put in our minds. All right? Just th what, did, what did you watch on Netflix just this past week? Was it any of these things? Parents, what about the stuff you let your kids watch this week? What about the stuff they listen to? Was it reputable, noble, true, compelling, gracious? Think, y'all, we're challenging today. We're going straight in. Buckle up. Think about this. We wonder why we have anxious thoughts. We wonder why we look just like the world when we are consuming a diet just like the world. It's sewage. Garbage in equals garbage out. Good stuff in equals good stuff out. Keep reading. Put into practice what you learned from me. This is what we're learning. What you heard, what you saw, what you realized. Do that, and God, who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. I love the message. All right, you guys want to circle verse 8. That's our anchor verse. Circle verse 8, because Paul is talking about the importance of one thing, and that is what you dwell on, what you think about, the thoughts that come in and out of our minds every day. If you're like me, you grew up memorizing this, probably in the NIV or the King James, and it says, finally, brothers, sisters, whatever is noble, whatever is true, whatever is right and pure, lovely, admirable, if there's anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So Paul is mentioning right here, all of, this should, all of our lives should be filtered through these categories. But let's be honest. Knowing <laughs> what good thoughts are is one thing. But putting them into our brain and choosing to focus on those is another completely. 
So how do we do that consistently? Break it down, Pastor Matt. This is the real world. I, I want a three-step plan. Well, guess what? I don't like three-step plans, but Paul has a three-step plan. It is amazing what he says here. The process of thinking thoughts, like what Paul talks about, happens like this. The first step is simply recognize the wrong. Recognize the wrong. Sounds simple, right? Mm -mm -mm. Be honest. How good are you at that? How good are your kids, your grandkids at that? Uh, this weekend, Amy surprised our youngest with her very first trip to go get her toenails done at the whatever place that is, right? <laughs> Clearly, she hated it. <laughs> it, was, it was a terrible time had by all. She loved it. And one of the things I love about this is as she's growing, she's getting older, she's starting to grasp and realize the difference between right and wrong. And it surfaces in the most, she's not in here, right? Good. All right, good. Let's talk about her, right? <laughs> I just don't, don't want to embarrass her. But she, she's starting, it's so adorable what she does. She, she'll come up to me and her lip will be trembling. <laughs> Daddy. Oh, this will be good, right? I, uh, I love you. <laughs> I think I might have accidentally, maybe, possibly done something wrong. And I think I'm sorry. <laughs> you think you're sorry? You think you did? Did you hear all the qualifiers? Maybe, possibly, might have accidentally, right? Not my fault. Did something wrong. She knows she did something wrong. <laughs> oh, why did she come to tell Daddy with that quivering lip and those giant blue eyes looking up? I mean, what, what am I going to do now? Right? She knows she's got me right here. And I look at her and I think, oh, precious child, I hope as you grow, you'll grow in the faith and knowledge of Jesus. And you'll be able to discern what is good and what is wrong, what is right, what is true. You'll be able to stand on that. You'll be able to teach your kids if the Lord holds back his return. Guys, we need to recognize and realize wrong thoughts and the damage they do. There are some good people who are internalizing garbage and trash. We have a whole generation of people through this pandemic who are so depressed, so down, down on themselves. So many who are suicidal. They're subconsciously having this dialogue with themselves. Man, I get it. It's what we do. Our thoughts revolve around us because they're ours. We are inherently focused on ourselves. Paul is saying the first step is to point out what's wrong, to recognize it, to admit it. We have to practice this with ourselves. We can recognize the wrong all around us, conversations people have, gossip over here, bad things in the world. Can we recognize it in ourselves and say, stop? Not today, Satan. I rebuke that. This negative thought, we're supposed to filter it through what Paul just says, whatever's right, noble, true, just, pure, beautiful, praiseworthy. All right, let's just take one common thought, for example, okay? Worry. Worry. This is a beautiful one. Let's say you find yourself in a constant loop of worry and anxiety. I want to share with you a very simple, practical example of how to take that negative thought captive and deal with it. First, we're going to look at it from a secular human viewpoint, see how this does. And then I want to talk about the real way, the spiritual way. There's a great story I shared years ago. And if you, if you missed it, it was about a sermon on anxiety. So I won't go into that. But if you missed it, there was a respected CEO, a very famous, well-known British film entrepreneur. His name was J. Arthur Rank, legend over in the UK. In fact, he made it on our own Time magazine cover. He was credited with starting Hollywood over in England. Okay? That's how big this guy was. In fact, if you're not sure how big Pinewood Studios was, we'll just pick a, a movie at total random. Uh, I'll just put any movie up, what was filmed there. We'll just pick one. Okay, Star Wars. How about that? Did, how'd that get there? This guy was a legend, but he had one problem negative thoughts. They consumed him. He had it all going. Everybody wanted to be this guy. Multi-millionaire, legend on the cover of magazines, but he had this negative thought loop that was going. And he was finally fed up. He said, I am done with these negative thoughts that are robbing me of my peace. So finally he did something about it. And he said, no more am I going to worry about things every day. And he picked one day every week to worry. One day. He said, I'm going to put all my worries on that one day. I'm going to pick Wednesday. So he created the Wednesday worry box. What an incredible concept. So far, he's got it, he's got it dead on. 
And he said, here's what I'm going to do. Anytime I get an anxious thought, anytime I get a worry, I'm going to write it down. I'm going to put my list here. I'm going to fold it up, and I'm going to put it in my worry box. And I'm not going to dwell on this until that day. And the most amazing thing happened. Guess what? When he opened the Wednesday worry box, when Wednesday finally rolled around, nearly everything he was worried about had resolved itself. Or it ended up being a non-issue. How incredible is that? He looked at it and he said, what am I doing? I am wasting my time. I am giving the devil so much power over me. I'm worried about things. 90% of it didn't even come to pass. How absolutely useless would it have been to worry about them in the first place? Isn't that great? Guys, guess what? We don't have to put our worries in some goofy little box. We can put our worries at the foot of the cross. We can drop them here. Say, God, take them. You said I could cast my cares on you because you care for me. And I'm done carrying this weight. I refuse. Put it down at the foot of the cross. Whether you're in college and you're overwhelmed with school right now, whether you're a post-grad and you are overwhelmed with adulting in a post-pandemic world, or a parent of three, a single mom or single dad killing it with three jobs, wherever you find yourself, if you've got that negative thought loop going, when you feel that fog come creeping in, recognize those thoughts, isolate them, take them captive, and drop them where they belong. By the way, I don't want us to focus just on our thoughts. This also applies to our words. Check out what Ephesians 4.29 says. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. In other words, let everything you say be good and helpful. Y'all want to know a secret? This is my prayer before I see you every Sunday. This is the last thing I pray before I get up off my knees in my office and I walk over here. You know that? I literally say, God, will you set a guard over my mouth today so that I say only what is helpful for building up others and according to their needs, that it may benefit your church. If there is anything that is off, will you cancel it? Set a guard over my mouth. Add what you want to this message. Take away what doesn't need to be there. Use it. Set a guard over my mouth. Let me build up your church. See, God's desire is not just good thoughts, but also to have these encouraging words to encourage others. This is why social media has such a large distraction, such a great time waster. This is why we see that negative robbing the people of their peace because they get this comparison trap going and they're searching for peace and they can't find it. You know what? I... I if you want to get your peace back, maybe, just maybe, it begins with recognizing what stole it in the first place. That was the devil. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. Call him out on it. You have authority over that. We're not some weak, oh, please, please, sir, I want some more. It's, no. Rebuke the thought, take it captive, and drop it at the foot of the cross. God, I'm done worrying about that today. The next thing we do, the second step, implement the replacement. Okay? So you've isolated the negative thought. Now implement the replacement. This is where the power comes. Don't miss this. Okay? It's not just I'm not going to think about it. Your mind is not a vacuum. You know that. You will think about something. Your mind will dwell on something at 2 a.m. Can I get an amen? When you are laying in bed solving the world's problems and you can't shut it down, I've been there. Implement the replacement. There are so many times in Scripture where we see Jesus not just wanting to take things away from people, not just wanting to take sin away and struggles, but he wants to replace it with something better. This is what Paul is talking about. He gives us a list. He wants us to meditate on those righteous things that Philippians 4, 8 has for us. All right, so how do we do this? Well, Psalm 1 gives us a pretty clear indication. He says, blessed is the one who delights in the law of the Lord, meditating it on it day and night. Blessed is the one, right? And you don't have to limit it to just the law or just the Ten Commandments. The whole scripture, even the New Testament, 2 Timothy 3 says this, there's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Jesus. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we're put together and we're shaped up for the tasks he has for us. Isn't that awesome? All right, so here's the deal. Those good things listed by Paul only come from knowing the word of God. They don't come from binging Netflix. 
They don't come from listening to whatever that, that has no redeeming value whatsoever. They come from saturating your mind with goodness. Do you know that? Do you believe that? Because a lot of us don't practice that. Think about this, right? I mean, church, we, we, we got to go. The days are getting darker. People are looking for hope. You're it. <laughs> Look around you, Ellen. We, we are the cavalry. This is it. We're the light. We're the ambassadors. Paul is saying, guys, you got to know the word. you got to know the teachings. You have to influence the way you think. Whatever we immerse ourselves in the most will eventually come out of us. Do you know that? In fact, Romans 12, 2, I think I have that scripture. He says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. So you know what i got to ask? How are you doing with that? Are you treating your mind with respect? Giving it the focus that it deserves? True transformation comes when we spend time meditating on God's word, allowing him to transform us, to renew us, listening to his voice. Now, there's a huge difference. I'm not talking about self-help, pop psychology. Whisper happy thoughts to yourself. Oh, bless his heart. He's self-defeating. No, no, no. The devil's already tried to defeat you. If you know Christ, you are victorious. I am talking about claiming and walking in the victory that he gives you. You are an adopted son and daughter of the king. You have victory. There is a huge difference. We have to listen to the voice of truth. Let me show you what this looks like in real life. This is so good. On May 25, 2001, Eric Weinmayer achieved his lifelong dream of climbing Mount Everest. This is incredible, right? This is a grueling, horrifying, hard physical feat that very few attempt, let alone finish. Now, what makes this so amazing, so powerful? Eric is blind. What? Eric Weinmayer is blind. Since he was the age of 13, he had a degenerative eye disease, and he lost his sight. It never stopped him from achieving his dream on a mountain where 90% of the climbers never even make it to the top. In fact, 165 have died since 1954. Died. Trying to do what this guy did. Why did he succeed? Are you ready for this? This is so good. You know why he succeeded? He listened well. Eric took a little bell, and he put it on the backpack of his climbing buddy in front of him. And he listened as he climbed the mountain. He listened well. Oh, are you getting this? He knew his guide. He knew the sound he was listening for. And he followed after it. But it goes even more than that. Check this out. He also listened for where he shouldn't go. His teammates behind him would yell out to him, Eric, death fall, two feet to your right. So he would know which way not to go. So he listened for the voice, the right voice, to follow and he listened for his friends to guide him out of harm's way. Do you catch that? Knowing and implementing God's word is the key, but you've got to know his voice. We hear it here. We hear it in prayer. How much time did you spend just this week in this? Man. How much time did you spend on other things? Do you see the comparison? I mean, if we're honest, a lot of times there is no comparison. We get caught in that endless cycle of watching those goofy reels. I don't know why they call them on Facebook now, but the, holy cow, this TikTok thing is unbelievable at wasting my time. Like the little dance moves and the Applebee's on a date night. And I'm sorry. Yeah. Ridiculous. I hope that's not streamed. Did you stream that dance move? Okay. Awesome. Guys, we have got to spend time in his word. If you want to be passionate about God, if you want to know him intimately, you've got to immerse yourself and actively seek him. And it's intentionality that will get you there. This won't happen by accident. I promise you the world ain't going to cheer you on. Your boss is not going to call you tomorrow. Listen, before you come in, I hope you take an hour to be with the Lord. <laughs> it ain't happening. You've got to fight for that. You've got to protect that. There's one final step in the process. Before I give it to you, I just want to give a warning. Some of you are going to reject this one, especially you men. Some of you are not going to like this, okay? So I'm just, but before you reject it out of hand, will you do me one favor? Will you just at least think about it? Will you just please just give it a chance? Because this is what we need. This is what Paul's talking about. 
the final step in the process is to embrace authentic accountability. Ugh. Pastor, I don't like accountability. I know. I get it. No one does. But it's for your good. Holy cow. Think about the pain that would be avoided if people had godly brothers and sisters say, hey, you sure you want to do that? Man, have you thought about the repercussions of what you're thinking about doing? Seriously, bro? It could destroy everything. Think about the pain and the damage that would have been avoided. If there's one thing I know about the body of Christ, it's that none of us were meant to do this life alone. None of us were meant to be an island. Can't do it. That is why I absolutely love what Pastor Jason is doing with our small group ministry. Because it has these tight-knit things. I hear just, just one small group teacher, that blonde right there that I'm married to, she'll come home and go, you know, we had the sweetest fellowship. It was unbelievable. Can't tell you what it said because it was just kind of a nice little intimate time. But just know that there are people loving others and bearing burdens of others. They're embracing authentic community, accountability, and love. I mean, it's doubled just what we're doing in small groups just in the last three months. Now it's on Wednesdays too, Sunday. There's no excuse. We got child care. We need this. We have got to plug in. In fact, I was just talking to one of our amazing youth just this morning saying, I ran into a person who knows Jesus and we were, we were able to share. They're walking the exact same road and, and they're encouraging me. And you could just see the joy registering on her face. You need that. You need that, that group, that accountability partner who will be there for you to be that listening ear. Do you have that? You need that person who will maybe even come up and knock you upside the head and say, yo, what are you thinking? Man, you got a blind spot here. Can I share something with you? Like, just us two? Because, like, you are about to step on a landmine. Do you have that? You need that. I've got pastor friends outside of church that we meet with just for that reason. To cheer for each other. To encourage each other. And, yeah, to challenge each other. To hold each other accountable. There's a great story about the military. David Gibson tells about an army sergeant who for 25 years tried to kick the habit. 25, quarter century. And he failed every time. And he went in for his yearly medical exam. And the army doctor was there. And the doctor said, listen, man, your health is being severely harmed by smoking. And you've got to stop. And the sergeant's shoulders just slumped. And he was discouraged and depressed. And he shared his honest heart and confessed multiple attempts to stop smoking over the years. Every time I do it, I fail. The doctor nodded. He looked at him. He said, let me ask you something. What do these two bars on my lapel mean to you? He said, uh, that means you are a captain, sir. So that's right. So that also means I outrank you, doesn't it? Sir, yes, sir. Okay. Then I am giving you a direct order to quit smoking. That sergeant's eyes got so wide. He gulped, stood up, walked out of the exam room, and never smoked again. Do you see it? Why? You see what happened? No, it took a true friend to hold him accountable and say, it's not good for you. Don't do it. Think about this. He spoke truth and accountability into his life. This guy couldn't quit on his own. Oh, this is so good. He couldn't quit on his own, but he could quit when he understood the power of a direct order from a superior officer. See, he was all in with the military. And because of his integrity, he knew he would never violate a direct order. Guys, we have direct orders from our supreme commander giving us commands. And we don't even know the word enough to live them, let alone share them. We've got to immerse ourselves in it. Think about this. Our commander in chief has given us orders. When we take them as seriously as that sergeant took the orders from that captain, we will change the world. But it took a true friend to hold him accountable, to speak truth into his life. For your true friends are the ones who want to watch you grow. Students, I hope you hear that. Your true friends are the ones who want to watch you grow, not the ones that gossip about you or slander you. Your true friends care about your spiritual health as well as your regular health. 
Embracing authentic accountability will require honesty. That's why a lot of people won't do this last step. It requires vulnerability. The reality is accountability. You may not like what you hear sometimes, but it is only when you hear it and you embrace it can you change it. That makes sense? That's where the rubber meets the road. When we empty out these negative thoughts in our mind, people close to you are going to be able to tell what's in your head, by the way, because of what you speak. Matthew tells us, from the overflow of the heart, our mouth will speak. It's obvious. You can tell what's, some, what's important to somebody, because within five minutes, it'll come out. Just, just listen. Just, just at lunch today. Just don't talk. Just listen. See what's on their mind. Right? We'll just overflow it. If you are willing, those close to us can provide that authentic accountability that Paul is talking about. People who will regularly check in on you. Say, hey, man, how's your spiritual life? You spend any time with the Lord this morning? Tonight, you've been in his word. How's your prayer life? How's your faithfulness to the Lord's church, to the bride of Christ? Somebody who will come to you, that challenges you to take steps of growth, forcing you to focus through all this fog on what is truly important. Make no mistake, hear me. Focusing on good things that Paul's talking about takes intentionality. This will not come naturally, but you will see amazing things. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to end a little bit. I'm going to give you your challenge, and then I'm going to pray for you. We're done, okay? I'm going to land the plane. I'm not putting it on the screen. If you're serious about it, get out your little notepad and write these down, okay? Here's your challenge I want you to do this week, the first week, first day. I want you today to commit to being in the Word. Okay, I want you to literally schedule and commit to a regular time to read the Bible. That's your first step. Second step, along with reading, I want you to have something to write down any negative thought that you have racing through your mind, anything that's distracting you, anything that's causing you fog, okay? I want you to write it down so you can address this. There's nothing wrong, no shame. Write down everything, it's specific negative thoughts that you got running through your mind. It could be thoughts about work, your significant other, friends, kids, your health, God, whatever, whatever's on your list, write it down, be honest, and have it there because I want you to drop it at the foot of the cross. And the third thing, what we learned from Paul today, I want you to commit to asking one friend out to lunch or over to your house to meet with them just for the purpose of being open and honest, pouring your heart out to another. You weren't meant to do this alone. That's why it's so hard. Quit doing it alone. I want you to commit. Find that close friend, that mentor. Discuss what you're reading. Discuss what you're Ask them to identify, hey, are there any negative thoughts that you hear me talking about? Am I whining about something incessant? Do I have a blind spot? I don't even know it. Will you, will you show it? Then ask them to pray for you. As I said in the beginning, this will require some rewiring. That's why I said that. This is not easy. Trust me when I say, though, it will be absolutely worth it. Will you do the challenge? Take time this week to open your Bible, to be in his word, to linger in his presence a little longer. Do yourself a favor and make time for Jesus. How in the world are we supposed to change the world when we don't even spend time with the one who created the world? Think about that. We have this. I mean... We, we can work as hard as we want doing all these things, trying to cut through the fog, but guys, if we're not sitting at the feet of the master, we're missing the play being called from our superior commander. We've got to do that. Stop focusing on all the fog, and let's focus on him. Let's sit at the feet of the master. Will you take the challenge this week? It'll change us. It's time to get serious, church. The Lord is coming back. I want to be found faithful and busy for him. How about you? Very reverently, let me pray for you. Would you stand with me just quietly where you are? I want to pray for you guys. Just take this last minute, and then I promise I'll let you out one minute early. Just tune out the distractions. If you're watching online, just do what you can to minimize anything that would pull you aside and focus now. God, I pray for these brothers and sisters. Lord, I lift them up to you. Such faithful, good people. Lord, would you give them encouragement now? I pray that you would bless their marriages. I pray that you would bless their health, their finances, their testimony for you. I pray that you would remove strife and stress and worry from their homes. I pray that you would give a lightness to their steps and remove this mantle of fog that the enemy wants all over this world. God, I pray you would cut through it. I pray that you would be the light in the dark room. Shine through us, Lord. Thank you that we can spend time with you. I pray that you would give us that one person to mentor, to, to come alongside, to whisper truth, to encourage, to love, to pray for, to hold accountable. Lord, begin with us. 
It's not about those outside. It's not about the laws. Lord, begin with your church. You said judgment begins here. God, help us to walk this week in holiness. Lord, I pray that people would see peace radiating from our eyes, even in the midst of storms. Hear our prayer, Lord. Do something great. We're so excited. We see the revival. We feel, feel the, the, the beginnings of what you are doing in pockets all around the world. We don't want to miss it, God. Help us be a part of that. May we be bold for you. May we shine bright for you. That is our prayer as we go today. In Jesus' name. And all God's church said, amen and amen. God bless you guys. I love you. I hope this was powerful for you. It was for me. I will see you Wednesday night. God bless. Have a great week.